Hello, and welcome to the Black Ponder. I'm Neil Trotter. Today, we're going to get contemporary. We're going to talk about some current affairs. We're going to do that through talking about this book, Words Will Break Cement, The Passion of Pussy Riot by Masha Gresson. Now, I'm pretty fortunate, to be quite honest with you, because I live in this country called America, USA, and in America, we have this thing written in our Constitution. It's freedom of expression, you know, freedom of speech, freedom of thought. We can do all those things as long as we're not infringing on other people's fundamental rights. You know, I'm not saying America is a perfect country, and some would even argue that uh, we can't fully, completely express ourselves um, to the extent that we should in this country due to uh, political corruption. And, you know, that's true. You know, I mean, it's not a perfect ideal that's enforced. But if you were to put America on a Richter scale with every single country in the world, and you were to uh, base that Richter scale off of freedom of expression for its citizens, uh, we would be pretty high. This country, America, would be pretty high, uh, if not the, at the top. And because of that, that makes this country very desirable to live in. We often take that for granted, you know, this right that we have, freedom of speech, freedom of thought. We take it for granted. We think that this is just how it should be. And it is how it should be, but we gotta remember that people fought for the right to, for this to happen. And uh, in many parts of the world, people do not have the right to express themselves to the extent that they should. It's not a fundamental human right. Now the feminist, punk rock, art group, Pussy Riot would argue that in Russia, this is still uh, a right that has to be fought for. Now there are people in Russia who would argue against what Pussy Riot is saying. They feel like that, no, your Pussy Riot is wrong. We can express ourselves freely, but then there's also a lot of people in Russia who would agree with Pussy Riot and say like, yeah, the government is corrupt and it is infringing on our right, not only to freely express ourselves, but also there's all types of injustices that are perpetuated by the corruption in our government. And henceforth, this is the controversy of this whole affair of Pussy Riot. What got this group known internationally was this uh, art protest that they did um, at a very sacred uh, church in Russia. It is called the Cathedral of Christ the Savior, and it's in Moscow. And they uh, went in, and they did, they didn't do it. They they didn't do this during um, service or like during uh, you know Sunday mass. They didn't do that, but they just they went in. It's a sacred place any day of the week, any time. They went in. They performed a song that said some pretty negative things about the Russian leader, political leader Vladimir Putin, and uh, a lot of people didn't like that. <laughs> um, most notably, the law didn't like that, and because of what they did eventually two of the members got convicted and they served jail sentences but now they're out after years of being in prison and now they want to they trying to tell tell the world that russia is a place where the government is so corrupt that it's impeding on the citizens right to freely express themselves and as well as they're also perpetuating a lot of injustices that uh, hinder russian citizens fundamental rights Again, there's a lot of controversy in this because there are quite a few Russians that are saying that what Pussy Riot is is that they're unpatriotic, they're traitors to their country. Why are they blasting our country? Our country is great. While at the same time, other Russians are saying, yeah, this is, this is good. Um, they're fighting for uh, our rights. Um, the government is corrupt and it is messing with our fundamental rights and this is a bad thing that needs to be exposed. So the first thing that comes to my mind, this whole idea of the law being used as an institution to prevent people from going against their corrupted government. Now, it's very important to not just blindly follow the law. You know, you gotta really examine the law. You gotta think critically about it because there are a lot of unjust laws that have existed in the past and still exist today. And you can't just ha have this position where it's like, well, you know, the law is a law. Um, I can't break the law because it's, you know, that's what it is and uh, we should respect it because it's a law. Well, I mean, the law is supposed to be there to maintain order, 
but it's also supposed to be there to create an environment where people can pursue their goals and live their lives to the fullest extent. I mean, that's kind of what the law is about. And if the law is not doing that, then there's something wrong. So don't blindly follow the law. Uh, I would actually want to uh, throw you back to uh, a quote from civil disobedience. I did a, a video off that uh, a few some weeks ago. I would argue what Pussy Riot is doing is a form of civil disobedience. Let me bring it back. If the injustice is part of the necessary friction of the machine of government, let it go. Let it go. Perchance it will wear smooth. Certainly the machine will wear out. If the injustice has a spring or a pulley or a rope or a crank exclusively for itself, then perhaps you may consider whether the remedy will not be worse than the evil. But if it is of such a nature that it requires you to be the agent of injustice to another, then, then I say, break the law. Let your life be a counter friction to stop the machine. What I have to do is to see, at any rate, that I do not lend myself to the wrong which I condemn. So what Henry Thoreau is saying in Civil Disobedience is he's saying, hey, if the law is perpetuating injustice, then you should break the law because injustice is wrong and the law can be used as a tool to make sure people fall in line, even if that means doing unjust things or being treated unfairly. Also think back to the people who were inspired by civil disobedience, um, Gandhi and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., right? I mean, these people, when they were do doing their civil dis disobedience, when they were protesting, they were in fact breaking the law when they were doing that, uh, but they were breaking laws that were unjust. So you can't just automatically say like, oh, this person's unpatriotic, they're not orderly. Uh, you gotta really think critically. Sometimes, you know, a lot. <laughs> Most of the time people break law and they are just some bad people and yeah, they do need to go to prison or, or jail and you know be punished because they are breaking the order of society but you know you gotta think critically about it because sometimes um, somebody's trying to give you a message and that's what Pussy Riot's doing. Let's jump into the Words Will Break Cement book and let's see a quote from there. In the old dissonant drama, Maria was choosing the role of the person who fights the court on legal grounds and Nadia was refusing to recognize the court as such and choosing to use it only for the pulpit it offered. They were doing what Pussy Riot had always done, illuminating the issues and proposing a conceptual framework for discussing them. As is often the case with great art, most people did not understand what they were doing, but eventually Nadia and Maria knew they would. And this is what Pussy Riot is doing in my opinion, uh, let me repeat that one sentence illuminating the issues and proposing a conceptual framework for discussing them. Okay, I mean, this is what they were doing when they were doing the church thing. I mean, that was a little extreme. Well, that was a lot extreme and that has some consequences and you can't forget that. You know, when you decide to, when you see something that's unjust and it's the law, like this is institutionalized, you do risk going to maybe see going even to jail or maybe even worse I mean you do risk that but in the end do you keep perpetuating this unjust system or are you finally going to be that cog in the wheel no matter what happens to be like no this is not right you know this is infringing on my rights and I need to do something about it you know even though it's this is the law or this is the co what's commonly accepted it's wrong and I need to step up and uh, fight against this in some way or fashion and get people, not only that, get people thinking about this issue and talking about it and trying to examine it and see it for what it really is, which is an, an infringement or an injustice on people and their rights. So if I could just take you back again, a lot of times people uh, read things like civil disobedience or other uh, types of works like that and they're like, well, that's, that's old school. You know, how could I apply that to today? Uh, you could definitely apply civil dis the ideas of civil disobedience today. I would argue that Pussy Riot is implying a lot of civil disobedience practices in their protests. So let me show you how Pussy Riot protests against what they thought was unjust, what the government was doing bad on their part. How did they protest? Uh, let me share some stuff with you because this can give you some insight to contemporary protesting, fighting against the system in the modern day. So before Pussy Riot was Pussy Riot, they were another group 
the older members were originating the whole concept of protest art and they're trying to form a band and a group and they're going about doing things that would lead up to this whole thing that they did in the church that got two of those members in prison they did all types of uh, art protests let me share with you some of them here's one they boarded the circle line at the scarcely inhabited midnight hour and quickly set up red plastic picnic tables which fit perfectly between the benches that run along each side of the subway car. They covered the tables with white tablecloths and rapidly distributed place settings, bottles of wine and vodka and traditional Russian bitter and sweet wake fare. This is at like a very popular subway station that's in Russia. They succeeded in capturing the very essence of the Russian wake, a party of maudlin abandon. Or rather, they captured the spirit of the post-Soviet wake, which, like most post-Soviet rituals, combined a memory of Russian traditions with bits of Soviet officialdom. It was a perfect tribute to Prigov. Prigov is like their mentor, somebody who was inspiring them to start the, doing what they were doing, and he was one of the people that helped them out when they were first getting started. Check this one out. This one's pretty crazy. Five couples had sex in the biology museum and videotaped it. The action was called Fuck for the Air Puppy Bear, a play on Dmitry Medvedev's last name, which derives from the Russian word for bear. Medvedev, a tiny man who looked like a cross between a third grader and his favorite stuffed toy, had been anointed Putin's successor the day after the action. He was elected to the office of president so he could keep the chair warm for Putin for four years. The location for the action was chosen for its animal associations, while the form was meant to communicate that Russian political life was like pornography, the commercialization, imitation of passion. So you think, you, you know, it's, uh, you think it's explicit at first, you know, just. You walk into a museum, you just see a bunch of people having sex, right? Uh, but it gets, you know, the shock of it is like, whoa, what, what's going on here? But then, you know, they're trying to make a statement and it kind of gets you thinking like, oh, okay, they're trying to show you this is what the hypocrisy is like. They're trying to use both shock value and symbolism. And you're also using some metaphors here to get you thinking about what's going on and what they, how they feel about the situation and how that relates to the overall welfare of the country. Check this out, check, check this one out that they did. Pretending to be students delegated by local high schools, they entered police precincts and replaced portraits of Putin with ones of Medvedev. Policemen watched mortified at having to witness what felt like an affront to the regime, but unable to act form because formerly the high school students were doing the right thing. Medvedev was being inaugurated that very day. Again, trying to show the hypocrisy of, or just uh, even the silliness of what's going on in Russia. Uh, trying to highlight that and showcase that uh, with this kind of ridiculous thing that they're doing. Um, yeah, they're trying to, it's like a reflection. Like, you see how ridiculous this is? We're doing something ridiculous because something ridiculous is actually happening, which is causing this injustice in our lives. Here's another situation. Oleg Vorotnikov, is a member of this group, donned the long black robe of a Russian Orthodox priest and a police officer's hat, entered a supermarket, and left with a full cart of groceries, but without paying, to demonstrate that both priests and cops were robbers. This was called Cop in a Priest's Cassock. But again, you see, uh, okay, this time they're explicitly breaking the law, they're shop shoplifting, but they're trying to show a message. Let's keep going. Bolina staged the hanging of five men, three representing in costume and makeup migrant laborers and two representing homosexuals, one of whom was also Jewish in real life. In the aisles of the Achen hypermarket, which represented itself unbridled consumerism and a signature accomplishment of Moscow's mayor who was known for his xenophobic remarks. Achen customers were handed hunting licenses, cards that 
purported to grant them the right to shoot migrant workers. Again, we're getting extreme, and they're using some shock value to try and hammer in the message of what's going on. I could easily see people getting offended by that. Um, and they're just staging this, pretending to be hanged and things like that. But, uh, I mean, this is what they're trying to do to protest and get people thinking about what's going on in Russia at, the, at you know, in this day, day and age. Uh, let's continue. They do all types of things. Here's another one. Boina smuggled a powerful laser projector into the attic of the Ukraine hotel, another Stalin skyscraper, and used it to project an enormous skull and crossbones across the Moscow River onto the White House seat of the Russian government. Just another thing that they're doing. Here's another one. They closed out the year by welding shut the doors of a Prichnik, one of Moscow's most ridiculously expensive restaurants, whose name referred to members of Ivan the Terrible's shock troops. A message nailed to the door said, for the security of our citizens, the doors of the elite club of a Prichnik have been reinforced. Sorry, I'm butchering these Russian names. It's just, I'm, I'm sorry about that. But l listen to this. Uh, Moina members had thought a New Year's celebration was underway inside when they welded the club shut. In fact, a britchnik was empty that night. Moina, by the way, was the name of Pussy Riot before it was Pussy Riot. It was some other members were part of it. It was like kind of the the beginnings of Pussy Riot. And they're just trying to uh, showcase the whole uh, disproportion between classes, uh, econ socioeconomic classes in that act right there. Uh, check this one out. They painted the giant outline of a penis on half of a drawbridge outside the regional secret police headquarters in St. Petersburg. When the bridge was raised, the penis erected itself right into headquarters windows. The action was called Fuck the FSB, which is the name of the secret police uh, in Russia. Uh, from this, Oleg's Voina graduated to damaging and destroying police vehicles, then to getting arrested briefly, and finally to fleeing the country. Oleg and Natalia went into hiding in 2011 and eventually reemerged in Venice, Italy. Why am I sharing you all these? Uh, forms of our protest by Pussy Riot or the beginnings of Pussy Riot, what does it all mean? Well, what I'm trying to show you is this whole notion that people who know that there's some injustices in the world, and it could be in America too, because there's a lot of injustices in America or just in the world in general, and people are like, well, I just don't know what to do. How can I fight the system? What, what do I need to do? I mean, there's just, I mean, what can I do? What resources are there? Um, there's all types of things you could do. I, mean, I just threw out some ideas right here. I'm, I'm definitely not saying or recommending you go this extreme. But if you want to go this extreme, you know, I, you don't have my uh, judgment at all. You know, go for it. And, you know, but know the consequences because, I mean, these type of things landed two of these members in jail. So you got to know those consequences. But our protests is a, a great form of not only fighting the system against injustices, but also getting other people just people in general aware of the issues because a lot of times people just aren't aware of the issues and it's not so much because they don't know it's more of voluntary like I don't know voluntary ignorance they don't want to take the time to or to go through the hardship of trying really thinking about the injustices that ultimately hurt them but they you know they're kind of happy in their own little bubble their own little shell that's why I, I shared with you these things that they did because it's, it's shock value because people sometimes need to be shocked and they need to see like what's really going on and what's the reality of the situation because again oftentimes people kind of just kind of hide you know not so much hide but are just they don't want to rock the boat uh, and even though they're uh, experiencing injustices themselves they're like well you know I just you know I don't want to do that and then there's people even further they are uh, so stuck in their ways they're they're hugely against protests of any kind even when they're being uh, infringed on in terms of their fundamental rights they're still like no this is how it is if you're going against this you are uh, a traitor to your country this that and the other thing uh, what i respect about pussy right is that they're able to go the extra mile and they're able to take risks 
and they're able to um, not only do things simply for the shock value but they're doing it and they're getting people thinking about what they're doing and uh, what they did actually you know it made me it got me learning more about Russia today but not just Russia just in general just the state of uh, fundamental rights like the freedom of expression which is still in several parts of the world major parts of the world you know Russia is not a third world country uh, you know they, they still struggle with these issues which is you know pretty ridiculous to be quite honest with you but you know that's why books like these are important so you can learn about why uh, fundamental rights are so important and also uh, learn how not to take your fundamental rights for granted when you're in a situation where you have your fundamental rights easily available to you would i say there's a lot of philosophy in the in this book definitely uh, a lot of political philosophy is discussed in this book um, the, there's a lot of things going to have going on in this book they talk about uh, the author talks about the lives of these uh of several of these members of Pussy Riot and it's very interesting. I recommend this book to anybody to have again so you can know uh, the state of rights, just fundamental rights in the world because that's very important to know. Really when you think about it, the uh, freedom, uh, the ability to express yourself freely and freedom of thought really, really, that's where we search, that's how we search for truth. That's how we start to understand what our lives mean and how can we help each other and things like that. I put a supplementary link below. It's a, a link of, from the Charlie Rose show. He actually interviews the author of this book and two of the members that got arrested. He, they're on his show and they're talking to him. And it's really good. It gives you like a lot more information that I've given you about this book. Uh, it's a good book. You should definitely give it a shot. And you check out that link if you want more information. This is The Black Ponder. I'm Neil Trotter. I want to thank you for watching. And never forget, freedom of thought is of utmost importance. I'll see you next time.